Hey guys, welcome to another spoiler filled vlog. So if you've landed on this video and you haven't read The Emperor's Soul yet, please know that this is going to be a spoiler filled vlog for it. I'll have non spoilery thoughts in my regular vlog and I'll have them in my mid month wrap up. But in this particular video, I'm going to be spoiling the book. So if you're not ready for that, then do jump off at this point. So we are reading The Emperor's Soul by Brandon Sanderson. This is a novella, so it is under 200 pages long. It won the Hugo Award at some point, so it is also one that has been critically acclaimed. I really enjoyed it a whole lot. It's the first book by him that I read after finishing Mistborn Era 1. And I don't really remember a whole lot about it, except for the fact that our protagonist seems to have this power that makes her be able to recreate souls and that her power is needed in service of the emperor to some extent. Don't know fully anymore why. And yeah, I remember really liking the magic within this one and really loving the concepts within this one. As you can see from the cover, we're basically looking at some sort of like rune system. I think this one is very much sort of like Asian inspired. And so that that idea of the rune and the way that it works is kind of going back to like Chinese alphabet, for example. And if I'm not mistaken, this is set in the same world as Elantris, which also has a sort of like system like that, where there is a sort of script that closely resembles something like Chinese. So I really love China. Chinese is a language that I wanted to study. I studied it for about a year at university and then I switched to English and Spanish because my Chinese sadly wasn't good enough. But I've always been fascinated with Chinese society, Chinese history, and I just think that Chinese script is just so fascinating. I think it has so much richness to it because of the way in which characters are built. So I really love seeing an author take that script and build a sort of like magic system off of it. All right, so I read over the beginning again. So basically we had our protagonist, I've already forgotten her name, Shai, but like her full name, Wan Shai Lu. So we have our protagonist Shai, who's basically this forger, which is this sort of art in which they can transform, for example, objects into perfect copies of others. But in order to do that, they need to have like full knowledge of the materials and the history of the object that they're trying to recreate or of the object that they are using to forge, probably of both, I'm guessing. And I really love that about this magic system, you know, I think you can easily take a concept like this and just make it be a super easy thing where the person who wants to make a forgery just needs to see the original in order to be able to create a copy of it. But with creating such a restriction to it, as Brandon Sampson has done here, of having to know the entire history of the item, having to know all of the materials and where they're coming from, really having full understanding of the objects you're trying to forge in order to be able to make a perfect copy. I think that that is just very interesting. It makes for a more difficult magic system. It makes for the fact that magic isn't just an easy way out. It isn't just an easy thing at your disposal. You really need to work for it. You really need to invest time. You really need to gather knowledge, to gather experience in order to be able to masterfully craft these things. And so I really like that aspect to this magic system, especially then when it comes to the soul forging. That also definitely makes sense, of course, that you would need to have full understanding of a person to be able to recreate them. And so that is definitely something that I highly appreciate about this particular story. What I also think is really fun about the beginning to this story is that we get to see this master forger and we get to have these people in high places thinking that they have her where they want her to be. She's in prison. They think that they've one-upped her by putting more different types of material in there than they've told her. They think that they have discovered her forgery, but in reality, the forgery is actually the one hanging in the position of honor, or at least that's what she assumes. We'll probably find out later in the book whether that's true or not. And she has been able to identify all materials. And so she's in a position to kind of demand certain things for herself, whereas in principle, they should have all of the power because they have 
her in there because they have imprisoned her, because they have taken away her soul stones. But I'm really already sucked into this story. It is definitely one that takes place on the same planet as Elantris does because we have mention of the language Svordish, which is a region of that particular planet. Not entirely sure timeline-wise where we are in relation to the events of Elantris. And I would be very interested to see Brandon Sanderson actually refer back to the magic system of the Emperor's soul. I don't think we use it in any other Cosmere works, or at least not in any that I've read so far. I don't think so. I don't think I've ca caught glimpses of it yet. But on the other hand, I'm also not the best when it comes to these Easter eggs. But I would definitely love to see forgery take place in some of his other works, in some of his other books. But so let's just dive back in and see what ends up happening. All right, so I didn't read a whole lot more at this point in time. It's like after six already in the afternoon and in like two hours I have Buffy watch along. So I don't think I'll be able to finish it at all, but who knows? Like I do have 15 minutes between each Buffy episode to read, but I, I don't, I have a slow reading pace, but we'll still get as far as possible today. But so I read like one chapter further and I just wanted to add that in that chapter, I mean, it's been introduced before, but we are talking about like the soul seals. And so basically every forgery has some sort of like seal at the bottom that indicates that it's a forgery or that turns that object into a forgery. And I find that to be very interesting. It's another link to sort of like the Chinese setting, the Chinese inspiration, because it very much reminds me in terms of its description in any case, of like the stamps or the seals that are at the bottom of, for example, like Chinese vases, the seals that refer to the sort of like um, artist who created that particular set, the artist who made that style. And at the same time, it's then also referring to the way in which the, the sort of like big forgery um, houses or the big names in forgery basically have become these sort of like mass production sites where people are just like factory workers who are producing copies and copies and copies of that specific thing. And so that is also reminiscent of that sort of like Chinese history because the very popular, the very prestigious um, artists also had to work in that way. They also had an entire team behind them who would reproduce those particular items and, you know, they would all go out as being part of that artist collection, even though they aren't necessarily created by that artist specifically anymore because it was a sort of like set formula that an entire team can follow. So I just like that sort of link between real Chinese history, real Chinese um, heritage and the way in which we are integrating that into the story. What I totally forgotten was the sort of incentive that keeps her there because I completely forgotten about this idea of the blood sealer. So a blood sealer basically also creates seals, but he creates seals out of bones and mixed with the blood of a certain subject, he can then link that seal to that person. So he is basically sealing her prison cell with a blood seal, meaning that if she breaks that seal, if she trans, if she passes beyond that seal, his minions will be able to track her blood and will be able to find her wherever they want. So I find that to be another interesting magical element in this world. And, you know, I find it very hypocritical, as she of course does as well, that they are willing to use a blood sealer against her, who they consider an abomination. Whereas from at least my perspective, it seems like what the craft that a blood sealer practices seems like a much bigger evil than whatever she is doing. But maybe I'm missing something in the history of this world that explains why they have such prejudices against the forgers, as they call them, or against um, people like Shai. So, continuing on now, and we'll check in with you guys whenever I have thoughts, which at the moment seems to be very regularly. I'm like one paragraph further into this. <laughs> but so it says here, like, few people understood how much forgery was about study and research. It was an art any man or woman could learn. It required only a steady hand and an eye for detail. That and a willingness to spend weeks, months, even years preparing the ideal soul stamp. Now, I find that very interesting because I haven't watched it yet, but there's a YouTube video out there by Brandon Sanderson about non 
hereditary uh, magic systems. And so this seems to be one of these examples. This seems to be the case where anybody can possess this power. Anybody can access this power. All they need to do is be willing to invest the time to study and become an apprentice to this craft, which I find to be very interesting. You know, uh, I think traditionally speaking, there was a whole lot of chosen one aspects to fantasy, not just the chosen one trope in itself, but the idea that people who have magical powers are somehow chosen. And so I find it interesting to see more and more authors explore the possibility of magic not being a hereditary art, but having some sort of a different system behind it. And what I definitely find interesting is this sort of idea of anybody being able to do it if you just learn how to. All right, so in the meantime, we have, yeah, if you hear noise in the background, that's my dishwasher. But so in the meantime, we have had quite a few sort of like, functionaries in this empire approach our forger in order to get her to build a sort of like back way into the emperor's minds. So basically they want her to make sure that the emperor who she is creating becomes a little bit more pliable, a little bit more willing to listen to their ideas, which I think is a very interesting aspect to put into it, a very realistic aspect to put into it. And so I like that there's sort of this like political play into the story as well at this point in time. And that of course we also differentiate between the real power hungry individuals in this court and the real honest men such as Gautano, I think his name is, or Gautona, who is then the real sort of like real deal, the real decent human being, the real politician who's in it because of his love for the emperor. Now, there are many aspects to this book that actually remind me of Stormlight Archive or even of Mistborn, for example. I will go through them here, but they are not spoilers for those books. So if you haven't read Stormlight Archive or Mistborn, you won't be spoiled by what I'm going to talk about here. But so there are elements in here that have definitely reminded me of Stormlight Archive. I'm thinking specifically here of the whole discussion of how forgery works. So the whole explanation is that each element in this world exists on three realms, the physical, the cognitive, and the spiritual one, which is something that very much is on the forefront of Stormlight Archive, you know, you might not necessarily dive into it as specifically all the time in Stormlight Archive, but we definitely play with those three levels, specifically when we are entering into Shades Mar, which is the cognitive realm, I think. Um, could be wrong, could be the spiritual realm, but in any case, these elements, this whole description of how forgery worked immediately reminded me of Stormlight Archive and of the magic system that we were introduced with there which is interesting because I don't think any of his other magic systems have made such a clear connection with the magic on Roshar. We know that all of the magic systems within the Cosmere world are within the Cosmere are linked in some extent because they come from one particular same god, but the way in which they function, the investiture, the way in which investiture works on these different shards is somewhat different, but so it's interesting to see this one be so closely linked to Stormlight Archive. Another element that really reminded me of Stormlight Archive was the way in which Shai kind of reinvents herself, the way that she is able to tell herself, be somebody who could deal with it, and then that is also something that kind of happens, as if she's making different versions of herself, which we will also see happen with a character within Stormlight Archive. When it comes to Mistborn, I mean, this is a link that kind of exists between Stormlight Archive and Mistborn to some extent, and that is that idea of exploring old documents, of reading old journals. So our protagonist is now going through old documents, old reports about the Emperor, but also going through his personal journal, and we have been able to read some of the entries within that journal, which very much feels like the way in which we dive into the book The Way of Kings within The Way of Kings and in prompts and in subsequent books within Stormlight Archive, but also in the way in which we go through the diary of um, 
and the hero of ages within Mistborn, for example. And I've always really liked that aspect to those two particular series. Always really liked the idea that there are multiple layers of text that we are exploring within those books and that those different layers of text end up forming a cohesive story and end up interacting with one another. So I very much have enjoyed that aspect to this story at this point in time as well. So I am going to be diving further into this, but it is now time for the Buffy Watch Along. So I am about over halfway through at this point in time because I actually thought this one was longer. But maybe the page count that I saw online does not coincide with my specific edition for this. And so it seems that I'm already over the halfway point of this novella. But so maybe I'll, I will be able to finish it today after all. All right, I was completely mistaken about the timing of the Buffy Watch Along. But so I've been able to read a little bit more. And so... Shy has indicated why she destroyed the painting. So basically the painting that she originally forged, she destroyed the original. But apparently she was doing so in the assignment of the original artist. So, which brought on this little bit of debate about, you know, who owns these masterpieces. If a piece becomes a masterpiece, is it still the ownership of the original artist or not? If the artist wants it destroyed, can he or not? Because at this point in time, isn't it part of the sort of like common good? Which kind of reminds me of part of a documentary about, um, what was his name? Francis Bacon. So the artist Francis Bacon apparently also destroyed a lot of his paintings. So basically I saw a documentary about him and like one of his best friends or like a friend of his was saying that he was often called into Francis Bacon's studio and he was asked to dispose of paintings that Francis Bacon wasn't happy about. And so a whole lot of his work has, ever, has actually never been seen because it was always because it was destroyed before the public was able to see it and i remember hearing about that and thinking like oh I, that would be like i would really want to see those pieces that he has had destroyed i would really want to see what he decided wasn't good enough you know what um in his opinion should have never seen the light of day uh, whereas, of course, he as an artist has every right to make sure that that never sees the light of day. So that's just a little observation that doesn't have much to do with the overall plotline. But another interesting thing that was introduced in the meantime is that she has created these five essence marks, as they're referred to it in the story, which are basically five alternate versions of herself, five forgeries of herself, five different ways in which her life could have gone, which result in her having these very different powers, these very different specializations. For example, in one of them, she could be like a sort of like a uh, master thief, for example, who is able to open all of these locks and things like that, who knows the back ways of the streets very well, who has a clear disguise and things like that. And one of these forgeries is extremely interesting because it is basically sort of reset button. If she uses that forgery, she will forget that she was even ever a forger. And so I find that super interesting that she would even do that, first of all, because all of the other stamps, basically, they have a way back. If she uses them, she can just temporarily use them and then remember who she actually was and go back to her regular self. But that stamp, it'll stick. It'll stay forever. She will not be able to remember who she actually was. And so she indicates that part of her wants this, though she also indicates that she doesn't really want to do that, that she is a forger at heart. It is who she is. It is who she wants to be. But yet, but despite all that, she has created it. She has put the time and effort into making that forger, into creating that possibility for herself. And I don't remember whether she ends up having to use it or not. I hope not, because I really like this character. And I really like the whole forgery aspect. I really love the way that we see throughout the story how she's just like upgrading her room to the point where Gautano now has had Gautona now has had to say like, well, you do realize that you have like the best room within the entire palace at this point in time. So I love this character a whole lot. I love her way of reacting. So at some point, for example, 
she was just like saying Gautona and then the other person is like, yeah, you need to refer to him with his title. And instead of doing so, she's like, okay, then the old man. And I just love her sense of humor, the way that she responds to things, the way that she is, you know, using her intelligence and the way that even though a lot of the time she's forging or she's actively trying to manipulate people in a certain way, there's a lot of honesty as well to the way that she interacts with people. The way that she's manipulating people is very much based on an honest interaction with them, on an honest relationship of respect that she's establishing between them. Another thing that I find interesting is the different levels of forgery that are going on in here. So she is a forger and the forgeries that we've mainly referring to and that I've mainly discussed so far are basically the real stamps that she's putting in order to transform objects into other objects or at least in other versions of that specific objects. And so it's interesting to see that she also refers to forgeries when, for example, she is creating this history of the emperor. However, while doing so, these notes are also being taken away from her regularly to see if another forger could maybe take her notes and create a forgery themselves. And so those notes become a forgery in themselves because she has to write them in a certain way that she disguises her real progress. And so on multiple levels, she's creating forgeries, but they're not all the real sort of like magical ones, but they're also just the ones that we would think of, the ones that we in our real life or in our real world can have. And that's just an interesting layering to this story. But so I am very close to finishing it now, and I will probably talk to you guys again at the end of this. I think I'll probably just go through it in one go now finished it and i think this is such a great story i mean per possibly one of the most perfect works that brandon sanderson has put out there and definitely i think now a great introduction to brandon sanderson so in that final section so we have shy's plan coming together however her plan doesn't really come together the way that she had intended to as she you know one of the prison guards as the prison guard who really had it in for her is the one who is actually entering her prison cell that morning however she still manages to make things work she escapes her prison cell and i really like that about her personality that she then decides to go and test her seal you know all through these past few passages in the story we've seen how she had that plan in motion to escape however she was stalling it she was delaying it because she really wants to be able to recreate the Emperor's soul. She really wants to see whether she can do it. She is personally invested in his story now, in this person. And so she sticks around. She is able to recreate his soul and see it work. However, because of that little delay, she also finds herself in a tight spot. And so the blood sealer now has her blood because she got injured in that fight that wasn't supposed to happen. So her plan doesn't really go fully to, according to plan. However, she thinks up on her feet and is able to fully anticipate the actions of Gao... I'm constantly wrong with his name. Gao... Gao Dona? Is that his name? Always. Like, I'm, I'm becoming less and less sure. Gauto and I guess. Um, and, you know, he's all like, damn it, you're manipulating me. Up until this moment, I thought that my actions were my own. But now that I see that you're waiting for me here, I see that you've kind of been manipulating me along the way. That, you know, I had my barriers up, but still you managed to penetrate them. And then she is like... But I had to do it the hard way. I had to do it the genuine way. And I think that that relationship that builds between these two throughout the book is just so amazing. Like really like a elderly, fatherly, protective bond over this young, foolish, idealistic girl. This sort of disapproving grandfather, granddaughter type of relationship. And I really love her telling that to him as well, saying that she will add a grandfather figure into her sort of like normal forgery and yeah I really love that whole thing and the way that she then uses those 
essence marks to completely transform as the situation requires it and to get rid of that blood sealer to get rid of the soldier who is behind her but ultimately the greatest thing is that manipulation that she puts into the emperor's soul the way that she nudges the emperor towards a better version of himself the way that she pushes him on a certain path well one question i do have is the fool that she's going after, the emperor's fool or the king's fool or whatever, who put her on this path, who landed her in prison, is that Hoyts? I'm expecting it to be the case, but I don't know whether we have confirmation of that or not. But I'm gonna that's my interpretation. The that that is Hoyt. Hoyt setting things in motion, Hoyt making her fix the emperor's soul so that the emperor can go on the path that Hoyt wants him to go on. I really love this one. In the afterword he talks about the link between this magic system and the magic system in Stormlight. So he refers to the fact that he was trying to make sure that this magic system is distinguished from soul casting in Stormlight and that the way in which he's distinguishing it is with that whole link with the history of objects and indeed that is also the distinction that I could see between them but aside from that the magics are pretty similar and so he's kind of acknowledging that as well in his afterward. He also refers to a trip that he made to Taiwan and where he saw those stamps, those seals and that that was indeed the inspiration behind this whole magic system um, and some interesting information about how dignitaries for example would sometimes add their stamp to a piece of art to show like their sign of appreciation it kind of is their seal of approval so to speak which is definitely something interesting that i didn't know was a practice at some time in uh, chinese history and indeed it is an interesting thing to think about that you would just be like oh i love this super famous work of art let me just change it by putting my own stamp on it you know let me just put let me just claim my own part of fame towards this piece of art something that now we would definitely consider blasphemous but so yeah i thought that was an interesting element that he explains in the afterward about his inspiration for creating this piece of art but yeah the Emperor's Soul, definitely one of my favorite Brandon Sanderson works, and I definitely need to reread it more often to make sure that I don't forget this story again, because I knew I really enjoyed The Emperor's Soul when I first read it, but it's been so many years, and I don't hear people talk about it very often, so it kind of wondered whether it would stand up, whether it would hold up upon reread, but it's absolutely amazing. I absolutely love this one. On that note, I'm going to be ending this spoilery reading vlog right here. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Let me know if you've read The Emperor's Soul, which <laughs> if you're watching this, you definitely should. And what your thoughts were on it. Did you love it as much as me? I know that some people don't like it, but I honestly don't know what's not to love about this particular one. But so yeah, hope you enjoyed this video and see you guys for a future one. Bye!